All right, welcome back to Soccer Matters here on ESPN 97.5. And as promised tonight here, uh, our, our final segment of the night is going to be a great one. Uh, there is tremendous excitement, not only around a new majority interest owner in Ted Siegel, but also in the new Dynamo general manager, Pat Onstad. Let me assure you, he's not coming back to play goal. He is coming back here to be the general manager of the team. He joins us now. Pat, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Glenn. It's been a, it's been a while, so I'm excited. Yeah, we appreciate uh, everything you're doing already so quickly getting into this job. And we're going to volley a lot of stuff off you tonight. I, I know you're a no-nonsense kind of guy, and uh, we're looking forward to doing that. So I'm just going to start off, obviously, with, uh, you know, it's a bit sad. Uh, Tab Ramos now is going to be moved on as the coach. Uh, just speak a little bit to Tab and how you came about that decision. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we are in a results uh, business. And um, ultimately, we felt... Uh, you know, the results uh, wasn't where we wanted them to be. Uh, but what I would say about Tab is uh, obviously it's been a very short time here, but I had interactions with him before, which I think I mentioned before. But uh, when he was with the 20s, we had a player, um, Columbus had a player, Abu Bakar Keita, that was there. So I got to know him about three, four years ago. We started speaking. And um, in, in the five days I was here, I, I can't, what a gentleman, like just a, a top class individual. And, uh, a guy I know uh, when he gets another opportunity will go on and be very successful. Pat outside joining us, the, the new general manager. Um, obviously, you're having to come in. You're having to make these decisions quickly. You're looking over a roster. I'm assuming you're going to want to have an input from who will be the next head coach. Do you have a short list of guys you're thinking about? I'm, I'm sure yeah, you've been thinking we, about we a have while. a short, short list. It's, it's right now a little bit longer. I think... Uh, um, you know, I've certainly been thinking about it, but uh, out of respect to Tab, I have not reached out to a single person about about uh, the position and, uh, until I spoke to him uh, today. Uh, I wa wanted to make sure that there was uh, this business. It's a very small community. Uh, and, and as soon as you start asking those sort of questions, it gets around quickly. And I think Tab uh, showed his professionalism right to the very end in Montreal, right to right to the right to the end. And you could see him and his staff were. We're still tactically trying to figure out solutions to Montreal, even even down to nothing uh, in the last game of the year. So um, I, I, the last thing I wanted to do was to disrespect him because I think the amount of effort he's put in towards this club for the last two years, you know, he's bled, he's bled orange, so to speak. And, and uh, it's, it's been impressive. In a coach, what are you going to look for? Uh, specific style of play autocratic guy democratic guy what are some of the key things to you i know the, i know the whole winner thing and all that but what are some of the keys for you yeah um for, for me I, I mean i'm a collaborator and and i, I want to be involved and not in the sense that i don't certainly don't want to set tactics or, or, or choose lineups but um you know i have a plan for a soccer leadership group and the head coach would be a big part of that um i think that's important that he helps guide the club uh, forward as well. Um, we use his expert expertise to, to, to help us become a better club. Uh, in terms of a style of play, uh, I think the best thing is to, to talk about is the, the way Ted and I kind of see, see it the same in the sense that we feel like we're in the energy capital of uh, the country. We, we want uh, to be on the front foot. And uh, the word I've been using is a proactive style and approach. Now that can take different forms, right? You can look at the New York Red Bull, or the Red Bull form of a full-on press where you're dumping balls in and pressing, but then you can look at a Bayern Munich, a Liverpool where they're, they're counter pressing and whatnot. So there's all sorts of different methods of, of doing that, but um, somebody that definitely is a, a type of a coach that believes in trying to play attacking football and being proactive in the way they, they play the game. I don't, I, last thing I think I want to see, and I think Houston fans want to see is someone sits back and tries to transition and win games one, nothing. And, and uh, I know as a fan, of soccer that's not something i like watching i like i like teams going down i'd rather see them go down swinging than uh than sitting back and then losing one late dynamo general manager pat on said a lot of people very excited about you coming back pat all right you, you talked about a soccer leadership here I, I know you do think out of the box a lot and i have a couple reasons why i believe that but um tell me a little bit about what that entails and how would that work um, I, I think uh, in every club, certainly um, in the clubs that I've been involved in, uh, well, at least with, with Columbus, uh, D.C., and, and even here to a certain extent before with, with Dom, is, is I think there's always a select kind of executive group that I think goes and, and you know, kind of guides the club of where they want to go, whether that's through methodology, whether it's uh, uh, through recruitment. Uh, there's, there's different forms of what that can take uh, through high performance department, for example. But uh, 
I think for me, it's really important that you have a, a select group of people that are experts in their field and, and uh, that they can, they can kind of try to be best in class. So I think we have an opportunity here with a new owner that is willing to invest. And, and I know we talk, everyone wants to, the fans all want to know about players. Oh, what are they going to invest in players? What are they going to invest in players? But um, the other, the other issue with our club is, is um, you know, we're a little behind in terms of the investment in the soccer operations department. So that's going to be very important because I actually think that will coincide with a better product in the field and us making uh, good decisions in terms of our player recruitment. So uh, it's important that we build that out, but, uh, if I'm the only person to make that decision and just I'm the only one hiring out and I'm trying to hire in departments that I'm not an expert in, that's not going to help the club. So I want to try to surround myself with people that are uh, intelligent, uh, have a growth mindset and, and, and people that can help guide me into making good decisions for the club. Dynamo General Manager Pat Onset here on Soccer Matters ESPN 97.5 presented by the Dasford Law Firm. We'll get more into that in a minute. Take us a little bit more into your job description, because one of the really nebulous areas to fans, and I know this through the years here in the last years, is they don't know who's making the player decisions. The general answer back is, hey, uh, you know, we, we both agree on it. Well, we all know everybody doesn't always agree. Somebody's got to have a final say. So take us a little bit into that and, and how a roster will get built out. And, and, and how you will collaborate with the head coach when it comes to players. Well, I think when you talk about a soccer leadership group, I think you, you know, you'd have a bigger group in terms of uh, maybe someone in each kind of aspect of the club. But in, ultimately, in the end, I think what, what works, uh, what I've seen work certainly in Columbus was having three people in the, the final decision makers. Uh, and one thing that uh, we did in Columbus, and I think we did a very good job of, is if there was one of the three that dissented on a player, we moved on and found another player. It was as simple as that. And then uh, the nice, the nice thing is, is we're fortunate. We're in, we're in a, a, a game that there, there are thousands of players out there. Gr granted you may, and I'm sure I know we passed on players that were, were excellent players that could have made it for whatever reason, but if all three of us aren't involved or all, whoever those three are, but the head coach, I would like to think is one of them myself is, is, is the other is that if you're not all in agreement, then there's always going to be finger pointing behind behind the scenes. Oh well, I didn't really want him. Why did you make him come here? Um, I want I wa what I want is a collaborative um, effort here to try to be successful. Uh, so where we celebrate together and and you know we have that heartache together too when things don't go well because we'll go up and down. But at the same token, if we're all invested in it, then we're all going to help each other succeed. Pat, what about uh, the academy and, and the production of local players, uh, a city that's got a big MLS history with guys playing in the league going back to 96? Um, how much say, how does that work with you and Paul Holliker? Yeah, and I, I just met Paul a couple of days ago for a quick hello in the hallway. Um, I, I would say in, in all fairness to Paul, at this point, like we will we'll talk and sit down, but I don't think that'll be a priority right now. The priority is to try to get the first team moving in the right direction or well, once we get there, then I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get, we'll dig into the Academy, but uh, first and foremost, I think he's trying his best to try to make inroads in the community. I think that's important. Uh, it's something that we went through in Columbus recently where uh, we really didn't have a great connection with the community and we've worked really hard at that. Um, something we talked to, I talked a bit about in the press conference and Columbus was a, a really good uh, hire was Dante Washington that they hired there, an ex player from Columbus uh, and he started running like youth youth partnership chips, uh, partnerships and uh, strategic partnerships. And he was really able to kind of get the grassroots growing again uh, and connecting with the clubs after years of, frankly, neglect. And I think uh, that's probably at the stage where we're at now where we're trying to trying to grow that again. And uh, I know Paul's working hard at it. Yeah, no, no question he is. And no question, though, that there were a lot of bridges burnt. So how was mm -hmm. that successful in Columbus? Like, Obviously, these are clubs that are run by guys that are making real money. They make their living at it. Yeah. How, do you, how do you bring them in together and how did that work in Columbus to get them kind of under your wing, per se, in a, in a, in a, in a collaborative way? Yeah, you know, the, I think the biggest thing was to get out of the youth market um, for us was, was uh, you know, where you're not, you're not competing on a regular basis. So I think that was important. Um, and uh, once we did that, I think that's when the clubs looked and said, oh, OK, you are kind of like following your promise and you're, you're following through. So uh, at this point, like again, like I said, it's, it's going to be a little while before we can dig in there. But at the same token, I think those are kind of big steps forward when you can uh, 
uh, try to work with the clubs rather than than recruiting against them. So uh, you, what you want to get to and in the, in the, when, when it's successful is you can help what you share your resources that you have. Listen, we have very good coaches in our academy. Obviously, at the professional level, we have great coaches, you know, U23 level. So those are resources we have. We have a great training facility. We have all these kind of resources that we can share with the community. And once people understand, like, listen, we're trying to grow the game as much as you are, that, uh, you know, hopefully we get to a point where they say, okay, listen, we have a we have a real special player here. Instead of us, I think we're at the point now that for them to develop further, they need to go and go to the Dynamo Academy. And that's ultimately what you want. But uh, until you just, when you're always taking, it's tough for people to trust you. Uh, so you have to be able to give. And uh, once you once you can start giving and showing that, that that it's real, that this is a real like collaborative, again, a collaborative effort in the community, uh, that's when you'll make some, uh, some inroads. So rebuilding trust is gonna be a big thing. How else do you incentivize them? In other words, uh, are there gonna be mechanisms in place if, if, if a player signs out of one of these clubs that there'll be some compensation or some kind of, I don't know, cross promotion, publicity. Yeah, there's, whatever. there's all sorts of methods you can do. Some, some clubs, um, you know, when we dealt with in, in Columbus, I was a, a privy to a lot of those conversations. Some clubs were just flat out. Yeah. I'll take X amount of dollars and that would make us happy because we need it. Uh, we're a club that needs, it. Or, or there's other clubs that, you know, what we would rather do is you have a, uh, you know, a club night at a game and give us 200 tickets and we'll be over the moon and, you know, put us up on the big screen or let our kids be ball boys one day. So it depends on the club. I, I do think that's obviously I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, probably a year ahead of myself, but um, I think there are lots of opportunities there and it's not necessarily one size fits all, but I, what I do think is where, where it's really important is that we're all growing the, the game together and we're moving in the uh, right direction. Dynamo general manager, Pat Onstad joining us here uh tonight on the show and uh, we really appreciate you coming on pat and uh, also uh, doing the tv last night i know i know it's uh, been a very very busy time uh for you um all right uh, are you aware of how much the fans have suffered down here i know you haven't been here i know you've followed the team but i want you to know from the fan base and and, and our soccer community which is prideful do you do you really have a grip on how people have suffered down here over the last you know eight nine years I, um, I think I have an outside idea, but obviously not living it for me to say I have a grip on it and a full understanding, I think would be naive. Um, uh, you, I can certainly tell you from a season ticket holder standpoint, uh, I can tell you numbers, uh, and that is, is pretty realistic in terms of how, how the, the fan base is. And, you know, I have lots of like when we played here, that that's the interesting part is that I connect with a lot of fans and would keep in touch with them over the years. And, Unfortunately, a lot of the fans that I've connected with are no longer season ticket holders, and that that's sad. And they still have a connection with myself, and I'm hoping now that maybe that'll help and they'll come back. But um, at the same token, we've got to regain that trust. You know, we've got to put a product on the field that people can believe in, they can be excited about, um, and and that's going to take a little bit of time. But I don't, I don't think for the first team, you know, for us, our, our goal is to try to be competitive right out of the gate. Like uh, we're going to have to work hard in these next you know, 75 days till preseason starts, but we won't necessarily have all the pieces in place by then, but we're, we're definitely going to work hard as hard as we possibly can to try to get this team up and running. I don't want to, I don't want to be a team where we're still building come July and we're still bringing guys in and the season's half gone and we haven't been able to, to, to go. You want to bring guys in as quickly as possible and let them uh, assimilate to the group and then hopefully get off to a good start at the beginning of the season. That's really important. And Pat, I want to backtrack and just, just, do you report to Ted Siegel himself, John Walker? How does that? Because look, these are all things I, I, I know I sound like I'm prying here, but these are all things that I get from the fans. These are the things yeah, they so, want to know. Yeah. So I, I, re I report to John, um, but I also have a direct line into Ted. I mean, Ted's uh, uh, the, be the best way to put it is he says, I, I want over communication. So pretty much every, every email I've been sending to John and um, John's starting to roll his eyes a little bit. because, like, this guy likes to over email. So um, I've, I've been doing that a lot and then copying in Ted. So I'm sure Ted's probably rolling his eyes in, in New York as well. So um, I'm very fortunate. Lyle Eyes is another, another gentleman that, that works with Ted. So between the four of us, um, we're, we're, we communicate a lot. I mean, through email, text, phone calls, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of communication going on. And, and obviously with uh, Tab's decision, there was, a, there was a lot of communication there. And 
making sure that we did, uh, we did this the right way and uh, you know made with that decision. But uh, so far, I think it's been excellent. That fantastic transparency there, uh, absolutely love it. I know the fan base will love it um, as well. Um, your scouting system, let's go into that a little bit and, and, and how you've done that in the past. In other words, you know, do you have scouts in other countries? Will you hire additional scouts? How much of this will be you beating yourself up on the road, being away from your family? How does this work? Yeah, well, it's always kind of been that way, beating myself up on the road. I mean, I, I, I do believe you got a forgiving wife and family. I'm sure. Yes, yes, Becky is uh, is is very kind, but she's also gets a little she gets a little uh, snaky when all of a sudden I'm around the house all the time. So she's just, <laughs> she's if I'm there too often, this COVID thing didn't go over too well. She was like, okay, time for you to start traveling again. But um, I, 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 I'm a big believer. Once you get to that point of like, here, here's our core group of guys. You know, there it's three to five players. Uh, I personally like to get my eyes on them. Um, I'm fortunate. I've been around the league now for 25 years. Um, I have a really good idea. I think if well, I mean at 25 years, actually 18 since 03. So, but I have a really good idea of what works and what doesn't work. And I feel like if I can get my eyes on them live, uh, it, it, I feel much more confident when you're, especially when you're going to go out and uh, splash some money around. So um, that's important for me to travel uh, in regards to the scouting department uh, right now, obviously we're understaffed. I think I've gone on the record and, and made that pretty clear. Yeah. Um, it's something I know from, from ownership, uh, and support from John as well is that, 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 I think that's, uh, for lack of a better phrase, almost low hanging fruit. That's a, that's a department that we can build up pretty quickly, uh, and get it to a point where we're happy with it. It's, uh, there's a lot of players out there. That's the, there's, it's, it's not a short supply. There are a lot of players, but it's important that you find the right fit for the club. Um, preferably you want to do it with a head coach in place. Um, but at the end of the day, with a 75-day window um, and now just starting the, the head coach search, it's going to be tight. There may be some players that uh, we'll have to sign before the head coach co uh, comes in. But uh, ho hopefully there'll be some players that the head coach enjoys and, and wants. Pat Onsad joining us here on Soccer Matters. So, Pat, the, the, the other day, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember where I asked you this, but I did ask you somewhere um, uh, about – you know, you made the transition that a lot of guys don't make very quickly into the competitive side, assistant coach, scout. Now you're on sort of the, the organizational side, still on the competitive side, but more as a GM director type. Uh, but I know there was a time where you wanted to coach. And I remember you and I, you yeah. had reached out with Robert Mascott, who was also another yeah. that that at that time you were really a head coach. Um, speak a little bit about how now the transition, because it's obvious when we look at your body of work, you've covered so many different areas and departments. You got to feel really confident going into this position. Yeah, I do feel like I have, I have a pretty good grasp on everything, but there's some areas, you know, the high performance department, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, the nice thing being the technical director in, in Columbus, I was in, in touch with the high performance department on a, on a daily basis. So I learned a lot. I have a you know, kinesiology degree, but that's what 40 years ago or something. I can't remember how long ago that was. Um, but, you know, I think we had stopwatches when we were measuring, measuring guys at that point. But um, so I have some background, but I'm certainly not even remotely close to being a, 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 I'm probably a beginner at best, but anyways. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think for my transition, it was, it was uh, interesting because I wanted to be a coach like most players do. They think that's it. And, and I think the more exposure I got to it, I realized, listen, first and foremost, it's a very difficult job. There's an extraordinary pressure in that position. Uh, and even more so now as the league gets bigger and bigger, more media, more social media, there's, there's a lot of pressure in that position. And, and I, I, I uh, you know, for, for some of these guys, what they have to go through on a week to week basis is difficult. Um, not to say I don't enjoy pressure. It's something I've lived with, obviously, being a goalkeeper. You kind of get used to it. But um, I, I think when I started reflecting back on it, I didn't know if at one point I, I thought, you know what, I enjoyed, enjoyed working predominantly with the goalkeepers, maybe be an assistant. Uh, and the story goes, I, I was opportunity when the, trend, the ownership transition took place from Columbus is that uh, I was given the opportunity to be an intern general manager for six weeks. And it sounds like a very short period of time, but you get an idea of what takes place upstairs and you get an idea of how the planning works and how you influence a squad and how you, how you can support a coach and how you can support a, a scouting department, high performance department, academy. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, Glenn, you've known me now since what, 2006, I believe. So 15, 15 years. And um, 
I think you know I'm I'm kind of an organizer. I'm and I think being a goalkeeper, a collaborator, as I keep I say over and over again. But uh, I think that's exactly what a good leader is, and and somebody uh, that's uh, at the at the top making soccer decisions. Uh, I'm I'm excited for the opportunity, and I, I feel like I've prepared myself for this for a long time. Dynamo General Manager Pat Onstad joining us. Okay, you mentioned the word pressure, and you know, look. People think I come on the radio here and all I want to do is talk soccer. No, I, I'm also trying to raise the bar maybe of, of the relevancy of the team in the community, I try to influence the other media members that are involved, um, but healthy pressure. It's something we all need, and, and I don't feel the Dynamo have that in this city right now. That That is a gem you guys need to acquire. Are, are you aware of that? Yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think to be successful, there has to be some tension. There has to be tension on players, on staff, uh, on front office staff. Uh, I think if it's just, oh, we'll come to the office and things didn't go so well on Saturday, that's fine. Then I don't think you're going to be able to improve. Um, now, does it have to be miserable where you're, you're going back and forth? No, it should be a fun place to come in uh, to work and you should enjoy, enjoy the people you work with and enjoy the project. But at the same token, there needs to be uh, some accountability. And, uh, and I think more than anything, we want to build a winning culture. And to me, winning cultures are built under tension and and stress and a bit of pressure. Uh, so you need to perform out of that. And there'll be some players here that won't be able to cut it. Um, I don't want to say it. there'll be also probably be some staff people that won't be able to do it, handle it as well. But to be successful in a successful organization, there, there has to be some pressure and tension there. One of my concerns, and again, uh, not that my opinion is that valuable, but one of my concerns has always been um, sometimes the lack of passion that I feel uh, around the organization, uh, people that have a deep-seated love for the game and a passion for it, um, those types of things can carry you through a lot of situations. I know you have it. I know the way you look at this sport now is because you've you've come through it and seen it grow to where it is. I mean, yeah. you know, you were playing back in whatever the ASLs, the Canadian League, you yeah. know, whatever the, the the other leagues, and then graduated, and it's got to even be different now from. 2006 to when you retired to where it is now it's crazy where it is really but it's phenomenal passion, do we we need more passionate people not only in the front office uh, or in the front office of a everywhere. team does that I have to bleed need, i think yeah i think we need them everywhere i mean uh predominantly certainly the more fans and the more passionate fans the better uh, but what i would say is the three when i first was a the, the level um the the soccer operation departments, everything, the high performance, all this stuff is, it's, it's uh, phenomenal. And what we've done is we've now have a much better product on the field. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're starting to get, we're starting to nip at Mex, uh, Liga Mex uh, at their heels. And uh, obviously with Columbus winning Campione's cup, uh, I mean, there's, there's these little, little markers now that are getting, getting dropped down where MLS is now becoming, you know, a, a, a league in the, in the region that is, you know, certainly a competitive level. But for us to get to the next level, I agree. I think it takes passion all around the club, within the club, the fans, the media, social media, you know, everywhere there needs to be passion about this game. And uh, I'm hoping that I can help grow that here in, in uh, Houston. Pat, um, can you talk a little bit in general terms about the roster, uh, about a type of player that you want? I mean, do you want a center forward? Do you want a holding midfielder? Do you want a playmaker type of guy? Um, is there anything you can say to the fan base about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is we need attacking pieces. We need to be able to score more goals. And I thought Montreal was a, a pretty good example of that. I thought in the first half, um, you know, we really struggled to get out of our own end. Uh, Montreal dictated the play. Uh, granted, I think we could have been a lot cleaner on the ball. I think we had some individual turnovers and some bad areas. But, um, you know, from, from a system standpoint, we were set up fine. We just didn't have the attacking pieces that could make plays when it really mattered. And that even just means getting out of your own end and gaining possession that the opponents have. So uh, you can, you can tell we need a few, a few more pieces. And, and, and I thought in the second half, uh, the first 15 minutes, we actually were on the front foot and we came out more than anything, just aggressive and created a couple opportunities. Granted, they, you know, uh, Griffin had a great chance off a set piece that, that would have been nice to see and, and see what we could have done with a one, nothing lead on the road. Um, but, uh, you know, it wasn't to be, and unfortunately we kind of let ourselves down on a couple of set pieces. Um, so I think for us, we, we need to, you know, it's going to be tough to win games one, nothing all the time. You've got to be able to sometimes, you know, maybe you give up two in the row, but if you can score three, it makes things a lot easier for everyone on the, on the club. So we need to find some attacking pieces. Based on all your other stops in your career with, you know, you've, you've really 
seen a lot of different things at a lot of different clubs at a lot of different not that levels. Old, not that old, Glenn. That, no, no, but I mean the, the the lens is there. That's 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 the that's the beauty of all this. Big, big, uh, people are picturing like Mr. Magoo glasses right now when you're saying the lenses. <laughs> no, there. they're not. They're not. No, I, I if I remember, uh, the female fan base was very entrenched uh, with the Pat Onstad and goalkeeper. Believe me. Um, so let me let me just get back to um, what I was going to ask you, and that's simply about you, you know you've been to all these different clubs, you've seen it in different ways. Is there a preferred starting point for you? Because fans love the tactical side. Would it be a, a, a four three three, a four two two? Is there anything you can say on that? No, my my I believe more in a like a style of play than I do in a, an actual formation. I and I think if you watch all these fantastic teams around the world, uh, no matter where they are, they change, they change their formations all the time. Uh, you know, whether it's Boca juniors, river played all, you know, to uh, Sao Paulo and then across the pond, like Liverpool, even, even they, they'll change their formations on occasion. So, uh, and if you actually look at most teams, for example, you know, I used to, obviously with Greg Berhalter, when I worked with him, we would, we would build up in a three, four, three, uh, but when we were defending, you know, we'd be in a, a four four two or a four two two two. Like so, we you change all the time. I, I think formations is is really just a kind of a I guess a snapshot of where your players are in position at the time. What for me is important is a system of play, a style of play, something that everybody believes in, and then that you're you're doing that throughout the club. So if we could believe we're going to be a proactive style of play in the field then we need to be proactive in the front office we need to be proactive in the uh, soccer operations department this should be a, a club-wide belief uh and and that's what that's what i'm hoping to get to and i certainly know i have the support uh, of ownership and certainly of john and that that's what we want to do moving forward uh, this is the style we want to be and, and this is what uh, the club the club will believe moving forward how much a part of your responsibility will it be to interface with other departments, even on the business side, to to espouse that message you just mentioned? Yeah, that was I was actually a really good part of uh, the whole interview pro process, and and John brought it up in uh, his defense, and he definitely had started that with Matt. I think when Matt was here, and Matt started uh, participating in a lot of front office conversations, and and going down, at, you know, we're physically separated, so that makes it you know by fifteen miles, twenty miles, it, it does make it difficult at times. Um, but I think I want to make a, an effort to make sure I connect with the front office and that they're comfortable. If they have great ideas that are going to help our club, that they're comfortable picking up the phone and, and giving me a call and, and discussing them. So uh, the big thing is that we work together and, you know, we're one club. That, that's who we are. You know, whether it's the Dash, the Dynamo, our Academy, our U23s, we're one club and we need to be working together. Pat Onsad joining us, the general manager. A couple quick ones more, and then we're going to be done with Pat. We really appreciate uh, this, Pat, because we do know how very, very busy you are. Let's go back to Columbus. Greg Berhalter, what was the biggest thing you learned from him? Um, attention to detail. Attention to detail. He was, uh, um, it was, that was a spectacular quality that he had, you know. I mean, he cared about individuals and all that stuff aside, but if you, you ask me, his attention to detail. And I think you saw that in, uh, in the team that he put on the field. And when I talk about like us being proactive and is a, is a kind of a culture, you know, and then having setting values for that, whatnot, you know, his, uh, his belief at the time was that we were, we were part of a collective um, and the way they played is the uh, you know, way we played was all 11 players have to be on the same page. And we played as a collective, didn't have any superstars. And if they got a little too big, some, sometimes we moved them on, but um, that, that's how, that's how the, the belief was within the whole club. And that's how the front office worked. It's how the, soccer operations department worked and uh but it was all about his detail and i'm assuming well i know you have a great grip on the usl the college game and all these other levels of the sport what about the canadian soccer league and and, and the new league that's blossomed up there uh, is that a place we can be looking for potential players as well y y yes and no i mean it's it's surprisingly is a is a higher level than i thought it would be especially with um uh, i hate to say it but the salaries that they have up there are, are not great uh, but these players are obviously looking for an opportunity and what they've done a really good job of. It's actually an ex dynamo uh, person. Ollie Gage is doing a good job recruiting up there. He's, he's been able to find some uh, diamonds in the rough uh, on, on small salaries to get an opportunity to, to kind of show that they can play soccer. So there are some players up there. The tricky part of course is now you're bringing in a, probably a project on a foreign slot and foreign slots in our league uh, with a few of the rules that are, that are changing in the league that they're, they're pretty valuable. So, 
you have to be careful. You don't want to go and pick up two or three guys there that don't make it. You want to make sure if you're, you're bringing a guy down from the Canadian soccer or professional soccer league, that they're going to be successful. Pat Onstad, the last one uh, we're going to lean on you with is just around, you know, uh, specifics of where you may recruit. You know, there's a lot of people who are in the mindset, hey, because it's Houston, Texas and the weather, we got to look south to us. I'm not sure that's true. I see Alexander Ring playing pretty well up in Austin with <laughs> Austin FC. So what, what are your thoughts on that and where around the world uh, that you think are maybe good uh, value? We obviously know that Argentina is, but kind of some thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and I, I would argue Argentina is good. Well, it, it's I don't know if it's good value. It's 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 a pricey market, but uh, what what I would say is they tra- uh, the that league translates well to the MLS. A very competitive uh, league, um, and and they work very hard. They have a really good work rate. So that's that's one reason I think you see a lot of Argentinians come up here and succeed. Um, I, I I I I don't want to push back too much, but I I do think at times like the Adam Lundqvist, the guys that are from Scandinavia coming to Houston are probably fewer and farther between. It's, it's a difficult climate to adjust to when you're, you've been raised and listen, I'm Canadian. It took me a while to get used to it down here too. So I think the only helped me is I had to go home to Becky who's from North Carolina and she just kept saying that stop, stop whining. So I, I kind of grew up yeah. quickly, but um, I, I do think it's important for us uh, to try to try to dip into the Mexican market. I do think that's, I, I and in all fairness, I think in the past, that market has been much too expensive for our league, uh, but now our our budgets are increasing, uh, and now we're starting to to get to a point where we can I, I don't know about compete and outbid players, but some some players in Mexico will look and say, you know what, that that's the lifestyle I want. I want to live in the United States. It's an opportunity to go up north, and they may take a little less money to 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 play in a different league and have a different experience. I know you're going to say first and foremost, it's all about the quality of the player. But do you think about the side benefit, the tertiary benefit of, hey, if it's a player from Mexico that people like, it's not a bad thing for our seats. And oh, putting people 100%, in. 100, yeah, 100 percent. And again, I, you know, I've gone on the record in this and I think the club feels this way, too. We want to connect to the fans and if uh, the fans are excited about a, a player that we can bring in from Mexico, then it's probably better than bringing a player in from Norway. You know, so uh, I don't think that the Norwegian community. With all, with all due respect to the Norwegian community of Houston, there's probably a few more, few more Mexican, a uh, bit, bit larger Mexican community here than there is a Norwegian community. Well, Pat, you had enough questions for me. How about a, a, just a platform to you right now? Anything you want to say to the fans at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, for, for me, I think the most important thing is judge us by uh, what we're doing. And, and hopefully uh, you'll be proud of the product that we put together, uh, you know, start, starting the season in 2022. Pat? Thank you so much. Uh, excited. I'm personally excited to see you back. It's a great face to see. It's a, a, a great man of integrity. We watched you do it on the field. We watched you do it off the field. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're the right man for the job. I wish you the best of luck in it. And thank you for all this time you gave us tonight. Uh, I, I appreciate you, Glenn. And uh, thanks for spreading the word about soccer. We really appreciate it. You're, you're a big reason why soccer is here. And, um, you know, together, hopefully we can keep promoting the sport. We'll do it. That's Dynamo General Manager Pat Onstad. What a way to end the night here on Soccer Matters, ESPN 97.5. You can catch the podcast at ESPN 975.com.